Uh, I know we're going to start in uh, James, but I want to go to the uh, 16th chapter of the book of Luke for just a, a, an opening uh, statement here, and then we'll go back to this later on. But here we have uh, uh, Jesus speaking, and at the end of uh, one of his messages, and we're going to go over this, but let me just uh, start with this. In verse 8, chapter 16 of the book of Luke, Jesus said, The Lord commended uh, uh, the unjust steward because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So we're going to just, I want you to just chew on that, and then we're going to go to our scripture today, found in the book of James, in the book of James, in chapter 3. So we'll turn to the book of James, in chapter 3, and uh, starting with verse 13. The Bible says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of all the good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and striving in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and striving, striving is, there is confusion every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James' message here shows us two kinds of wisdom. And so we're going to talk this, this morning, we're going to be talking about the two kinds of wisdom. The first one is mentioned is the wisdom which is from heaven or heavenly wisdom and it is, uh, uh, it is marked with meekness, the works of that, that we do and how we live. It's called in the scripture our conversation. And the second wisdom is worldly wisdom which the Bible describes as envying, strife, confusion, and evil work. Now, sometimes the two of these things are intermingled. And I have known many people in the church who have confused wisdom with craftiness. They've confused wisdom with being sly. We have many people who are sly, and they think that being sly, that they have the wisdom of God. But that's not God's wisdom. God's wisdom, the Bible says, is, first of all, the way that we can tell that it's God's wisdom is that it is peaceable. Okay? It says that it's peaceable. It's without partiality. And so when we have people who are partial to one or they favor one and they dislike another, we know that that does not come or proceed from God. That is not godly wisdom. And let me talk about worldly wisdom for just a moment. Worldly wisdom is craftiness, it's slyness, it's trickery. When we see many of the, uh, in the church, we see many uh, uh, ministers or lay leaders or, or different people who seem to have a, a, a wisdom, but in fact, if we, if we watch carefully, we can, and we know the truth, some of it is just plain craftiness or slyness, or it's, a crafty take on, on people. The sly find a way to con you or to beat you out of something. That's slyness. They have something up their sleeve when they come to you. You know, when they come, uh, you, you, something up your sleeve is taken from the old, uh, uh, when men used to play uh, cards out west, you know. I think in the east they do it too. But we used to watch these uh, cowboy programs and the guys playing, cow, uh, playing uh, cards, you know. And he'd have an ace in his sleeve over here. 
and he'd be in the he'd be playing along, you know, and all of a sudden he'd go like this and boom, he pulls out an ace. He's he had something up his sleeve. He was crafty and he was winning. And we have many people, even in the church, I have to say, who are like that, who have that something up the sleeve, and they call that godly wisdom, but it is not godly wisdom. It's just a wisdom of this world. It's a trick of the devil. Uh, we have a, a scripture in the Old Testament about a man named Jacob. And you know, Jacob of old, he was a crafty character. He uh, uh, beat his brother out of his birthright. You remember the story over a bowl of lentil soup. Him and his mother got together and they beat their brother out of the birthright. And then he was crafty. Uh, he puts a, a, a sheepskin or something on his goatskin on his arm because his brother Esau was a hairy man. So he puts this uh, on his arm and he goes to his father who was blind and his father felt it, you know, and he felt the, the hair and he says, oh yeah, yeah, you're Esau, I'll give you the blessing, you know. That was not wisdom, that was craftiness. That is something we learn, we have to learn the difference between the two. Where do they get this from? The Bible says here, in the book of James, it says, but it is earthly, it is sensual, it is devilish. It is devilish, it is satanic, it is from the devil. Well, you know, when we read in the scripture, we find that when God created the angels, he created this one angel, which was, we call today, we call him Lucifer, because Lucifer means a great light. Lucifer, this, this angel, he was a... He was a beautiful creature and probably still is. He's not this little uh, red creature with the horns, you know. That's uh, man-made. The devil really, you know, the Bible says that he masquerades as an angel of light. He masquerades, comes to us as uh, a, a light bringer be because he has, the Bible says that when God created him, that he gave him a full measure of wisdom. This character... This devil, this, this person, he influences the world. He influences his people. He'll try to influence you. He'll come even to God's people. And he tries to influence them with his wisdom. But his wisdom is not what we need. It's not what we want. We want heavenly wisdom. We want something coming from God. We don't want it coming from the devil. But the old devil, you know, he uh, 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 brings this crafty thing to the people today, even in our churches, and they think they're doing God's will. They think they have, they, have, they have something from God, a great wisdom, and they have convinced the church, some in the church even, that they are doing God's work. But they come in and they rob widows and they steal from people and they... They make it out like they're doing something good for somebody, but in fact, what they're doing is using the devil's craftiness. And I have to tell you that there are two groups of people in the world, and I always say this, and don't ever forget this, there are two groups of people in the world, the black people and the white people. No, that ain't it. That's not it. Because I, know, I have some dear friends who are black, and they are just as saved as any white person would ever be. Okay? So you can be a, a, a red, a yellow, green, or black, or any color, and you belong to the family of God, or you belong to the family of this world, to the family of the devil. And if you are the family of God, you should be seeking the wisdom which is from above. Be careful, I said, be careful of the wisdom of this world. Be careful of the craftiness of the world because the world, in, especially in our age, is trying to tell us they're trying to set the moral standard for what's right and wrong. And they morally, they try to tell us, you know, well, this is the right thing, you know, and, and especially today, over the last few weeks, we've been having this uh, situation with uh, uh, this uh, concerning uh, these uh, pedophiles. And so the world wants to stand up and tell us how, how uh, righteous they are and how the, much they're against the pedophile and against this one and against that one. These are crimes against society. These are crimes against society and terrible things. But be careful, be very careful 
about the wisdom of this world. Be careful about the morality of this world, the morality that they have set up. We have to understand that the Bible says that the wisdom that is from above is first pure. It is first pure. It's clean. And it means that it is righteous. That means that it comes from God. That means that we have to be careful, you know, if we say that if we claim one thing is wrong, like we claim, uh, you know, uh, what a terrible thing that it is that we have in our society that, uh, uh, that uh, young people are being uh, molested and bothered in this way. I think that's a terrible thing. But let's add the whole thing, the whole picture. Let's look at the whole picture. All of the things that happen in this life, all of the uh, 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 discrimination and so on against the Word of God, because all immorality, all immorality is bad against God. Not just child molestation, but when we talk about homosexuality, when we talk about uh, those that steal and rob and those that are dishonest, all of these things are dishonest before God. All of these things are bad. Let's not pick and choose the things that we like and the things that we don't like, you know, and be careful of the, that craftiness of worldlyism. Uh, for here it says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, and then gentle, and easy to be entreated. Okay, that means that we, uh, it's easy to come upon upon the wisdom that is from God. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, we looked at some of the texts that we have here. Uh, it says that it is peaceable. Peaceable. The wisdom that is from above is peaceable. When we see those that have no peace in their life, they always have strife. they are always got this problem going on and that problem going on, you know, and uh, always looking for this and looking for that and always and uh, they have never found the wisdom that is from god they've never found that wisdom all they have is all they have is this you know you know when you have a problem let me say you have a problem and you are uh, you want to solve your problem so where do you go you go to a psychologist you go to someone who uh, might be able to advise you give you some kind of uh, uh, steer you in the right direction or so on in that thing you know but what happens when you have a problem and you go to someone and they steer you they say go over here and then another six months or a year down the road you find yourself in the same problem you go back to the same person you go back and you say well you know uh, you gave me this advice that didn't work now what will I do and they give you something okay try this over here you know now, all of these things are the wisdom of this world. And uh, the wisdom of God, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, sometimes we, it's the last place that we want to go to get our advice is from any one of God's people. Oh, no, 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 I won't go there, you know, because I know what he's going to tell me. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament where there was two kings and one king wanted to go to war. And he said, you know, he says, will you go to war with me against this, this uh, nation? And the other king said, well, you know, I, I will go to war, but we should take advice. We should hear from God and see what God has to say. And this other king that wanted to go to war, you know, he said, you know, he says, I have all these uh, uh, priests and all these counselors and all these people. Let's ask them. So he asked all, the, all of his Yes, men, and all his yes men said, yeah, go to war, yeah, 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 go to war, and we see you winning the war, and we see this, and we see that, you know. And the other king, you know, and the other king, uh, he, uh, one king's name was Ahab, he was the one who wanted to, he's the one who wanted to go to war, and the other king was Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat said uh, to King Ahab, he says, you know, he says, he says, uh, he says, don't you have anyone else that we could have, I know you have all these people, but don't you have anyone else that we could get some advice from? And the king says, yeah, he says, you know, he says, I do have this other guy, he says, that I could ask, he says. Uh, he says, but you know what? Every time I ask him something, he never gives, he never tells me what I want to hear. He always, get, he always has a bad word for me. And you know what? When you come into 
uh, uh, God's house into God's kingdom and you come in for advice, you know, if you have a mindset that you want to do a certain thing or if your mindset is not on the things of God and you come in and you ask counsel of those things of God, certainly they're not going to go along with what you want. So what happens? So what happens? The, you hear that word, you hear that message, but you don't like it because you want to do something else. And this is what happened with this king. He didn't want to hear the advice of his prophet, this one prophet. And the prophet came to him and says, if you go there, you're never coming back. He says, so uh, Ahab turned to Jehoshaphat and he said, see what I told you. He never tells me anything good. He always has a bad word for me. You know what? It's better to hear the word of God. It's better to hear what God has to say, the truth of God's word, than to hear the counsel of, of, of a thousand other people who are going to tell you and give you worldly wisdom, uh, 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 crafty wisdom, sly wisdom, how to get away, how to beat it, how to get around the corner, how to... How to how to uh, 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 get, you know, uh, beat it, you know, what I mean, so to speak, rather than coming right out and saying, this is what God's Word has to say about this. For the Word of God, the wisdom from above, is peaceable and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And this hypocrisy, you know, is, is saying one thing, and doing something else. And I know uh, uh, I have had, uh, I've been privy to some uh, uh, things that have happened where I've heard people sit in church uh, uh, boardrooms and talk about what they wanted to do, but when they got out of the boardroom, they absolutely did not want to do that. They wanted to do something else. And that's a hypocrisy. Hypocrisy right in the church. Let's start being honest with ourselves. Let's turn our hearts toward God. Let's say the things that we mean and mean the things that we say. Let's not be, let's be wise and not otherwise. Let's turn to the Word of God and, and find the wisdom of God's Word rather than try to find our own wisdom. And then we end up like this king, this Ahab, who would not hear the counsel of God but rather would hear the counsel of those who uh, would only say the things that the king wanted to hear. Listen, if you want to hear your own advice and you want to hear somebody that's going to give you what you want to hear, chances are you're in trouble already. You're already in trouble, okay? So you need to hear something that maybe you don't like to hear. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not what is in your heart. Maybe it's not what you're... Uh, what's uh, what God has for you. Let's uh, turn back to the book of Luke for just a moment. And I want to just uh, show you here uh, what uh, <clears throat> the difference now here. Jesus says, and we started out with this scripture, it says, and the Lord, this is in Luke chapter 16, and verse 8, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world in their generation are wiser than the children of light. And you know what happens is that sometimes the children of light become so gullible. They allow every little thing. They, they hear something and they, they, wow, they drop to their knees over it. You know what I mean? Rather than to take it back and see what God's word has to say. There is a wisdom of the world. Let's not deny that. The devil, you know, the Bible says that God gave him a full measure of wisdom. This character is a wise person. But his wisdom will never glorify God. His wisdom will never honor or give you any respect. All it does is, it, it, you, know, you know, the best uh, description of worldly wisdom is what the lawyers, most lawyers have today. And a lawyer, you know, a lawyer has to go into court and he has to defend somebody who might, might be guilty, you know, of a crime. But yet he has to defend that person and he has to find uh, if he can get that person out of trouble. And he will use whatever means or measures that he can to get this person off. Whether they're really guilty or whether they're not guilty of that crime, you know. And sometimes what happens is that that person 
uh, we have people who are released into back into society because of a a crafty or a wise lawyer who was able to uh, 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 get that person off on a technicality or on some uh, some uh, uh, law that they've been able to twist or turn, you know, and th and that type of that type of thing goes on every day, and it's because if you put enough money in a lawyer's pocket or if he can get into your pocket deep enough, he'll come up with something to get you off or get you out of it, you know. And uh, so here in this story, we find that this unjust steward had had uh, 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 done something good for his uh, for his master by by uh, uh, taking the people who had owed money, and he took a portion of that money back to get something out of, at least get something out of it, because he knew he wasn't going to get anything if these people just refused to pay. So he was able to uh, uh, get some money for his master, you know. But we're talking about the wisdom of God's Word and how that got... Now here Jesus uses this description to show us that there is wisdom in the world. There is a worldly wisdom. It's not a false wisdom it, but it is a crafty wisdom okay and we don't want no part of that and uh, when you find uh, ministers who are cheating the congregation by not giving them the bread of life they're giving them something else when you find the ministers who are uh, going into widows homes and and robbing the widows and taking what widows have you know or or and not just widows, but anybody or anything that they can get from somebody, and they want to take those things to themselves, be careful of that kind of thing. And it should, it should be a warning to us. It should be something that we're looking at. Now back in James, and I want to close with this, in the book of James, in chapter 3 again, and uh, let me just read through some of this again. Uh, verse 13, it says, who is, wise, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge from uh, a, a knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So here is a commendable thing that God is saying to all of us that we... Uh, uh, if we find a wise man, if we find somebody who has it, has some kind of not, one of the ways that we can tell is by their conversation. That means by not just by what they do with their lips, but their conversation here. This scripture means their walk, how they live, what kind of a lifestyle do they live. All right. And so, verse fourteen. But if ye have bitter envying and striving and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. All right, there is a, again, there is a wisdom. There are two kinds of wisdom. I just want to set this straight, that we understand this. That when you hear somebody speaking, and you say, oh, that person's a wise person. We go by not just the words that they speak, what type of life are they living? What is their walk? What is their conversation, so to speak? And in our conversation, you know, if you have somebody who shows partiality, who uh, uh, likes to be around with the wealthy people, or likes to be around those that are, that are affluent, and doesn't have much to do with those that maybe, like me, that don't have anything and just live on the side, you know, uh, those types of people, you don't need them in your life. You know, you don't need those people that show partiality. Well, we don't need that kind of thing. For verse 16, for where is envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Look at that. For where there is envying, and somebody is envious, you know, coveting. Oh, ah, uh, he, you know, ah, uh, oh, I don't like, oh, wow, well, uh, you know. Ding, 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 ding. That wisdom that he has is not from God. It's from the world. Let's be careful. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then it's peaceable. It's gentle and easy to be entreated, full of 
mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. What goal, what is the goal, think about this now, what is the goal of heavenly wisdom? What is the purpose that God would give us heavenly wisdom? What is it? And where can we find it? Where can we find this heavenly wisdom? Well, first, the goal of heavenly wisdom is to help us to live a life in this life, to live a peaceable and prosperous life in this life. And then secondly, it is to see that we're on the right road. You see, because the wisdom that God gives us will bring us to the right path. Okay, Jesus said that there are two roads. And there is a narrow road, a straight and constricted road. And the end of that road leads to eternal life. And so wisdom, godly, heavenly wisdom, will put us on that road and bring us to eternal life. Now, eternal life can only come by believing in Jesus Christ. You cannot have eternal life by any other means. Because the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him, whoever believeth, this means to put your trust and rely upon Him and then you can have, your, by this belief and by being on this road, the Bible says that you will not come into condemnation, you will not perish but have everlasting and eternal life. And so... We want to find eternal life. And some people say, well, can I have eternal life if I, if I uh, live... I may not live a perfect life, but can I have eternal life? For example, if I'm, a, if I'm gay, if I'm a homosexual, can I have eternal life? Well, any person, no matter what sin or no matter what condition of their life, can come into the kingdom of God. Listen to me now, very carefully, listen to me. You can come into the kingdom of God. But when you come into the kingdom of God, the, you have got to allow the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God to come into your life. And the wisdom of God will change your life. It will turn you around. You may not be a homosexual, you may not be a thief, you may not be a murderer, but... You came into the kingdom of God through because you were a sinner, because you had sin in your life, and you have asked Christ to cleanse you from your sin. You've asked Him to cleanse you. You, you have repented. That means, the word repent actually means you're going in this direction, and all of a sudden you stop, you turn 180 degrees, and you go the other way. That's what the word repent means. So if you were living a life of sin... You are living a certain condition. You come into the kingdom of God. You repent of your sin. You turn around and you go the other way. Now, if you, had, uh, if you were gay, you have to understand. The Bible says that that is an abomination. Now, an abomination is about as bad as you can get in the, when uh, we have a description of things that are not right. You know, uh, I don't know of any other word in God's word that would supersede or be greater than the word abomination. Abomination is like at the top of the list. If something is an abomination in the eyes of God, that's got to be pretty bad. Okay, That's got to be pretty bad. So if you come into the kingdom of God and you've been practicing an abomination, well, when you come into the kingdom and you really, really mean, I want to be a son of God. I want to, I want to come into His kingdom. I want to have eternal life. The Bible says you have to repent. That means you have to turn around. That, that means you have to forsake your sin. You have to leave your sin and you have to go on with God. Now, I, what I'm imparting to you is a true wisdom from the Word of God. This is the true wisdom of God's Word. That you cannot come into the kingdom of God and remain the, in the same sin or in the same condition that you were. The Bible says that that you must allow God to make a transformation of your mind and your heart. A change of life has to come into your heart. I remember one time when I was a kid, we lived in a home, right? Not too far from here, just around the corner. It was a big old house, and it had a, uh, a furnace in the basement. It had a coal 
uh, burning fire in the basement and it had one of these octopuses. You ever see one of these things? It was a huge, huge uh, uh, furnace and it had all these these arms coming off from it, going upstairs. It, it, it looked like an octopus. It had all these things off like this. And uh, we used to go up there, you know, and we used, we used to go in the basement, and we, it had a, a, like a shaker, you know, and it had this, uh, this uh, arm thing we'd put on it and go like this, and it would shake the ashes down in the bottom. And in the wintertime, we had this like a little box that looked like a, it looked almost like a, like a, um, uh, just like a drawer, but it had like a tin laying in the bottom. And we used to shovel out these hot ashes, and we used to put them in the, the, the box, you know. And then we'd carry the box up, and we'd put the hot ashes on the steps, in, in, on the ice. You ever do that, huh? Put the hot ashes on the steps like this. And then you'd go... When you went outside, it would melt the it would melt down, you know. But then it would leave like this ashy, uh, crunchy stuff, and you'd be walking on this, and you drag it into the house, you know, <laughs> and drag it across the rug and everything, you know. And what a condition, what a mess! But you go through it every year. You would go through it in the winter time, and you're living this here today. If we lived under those conditions, my wife would say it, it was an abomination. You're going to bring that ash and that mud into my house and on my floors, you know, but we used to have rugs and you'd have to clean your feet off on the rugs, you know, and then wipe your feet off like that and then you'd come in, you know. And so one day, one day my father took the, this big octopus and brought it out of the house. We dragged that thing out in pieces, took all the pieces of pipe and then we had to take the thing apart, you know, and it came apart in rings, a big ring like this big ring petition things like this and then with the doors and everything we took it all out of there and we swept the floor clean you know and he got this furnace this furnace was no bigger than this uh, pulpit here and it had one pipe that went up and one pipe that came back uh, going in and coming out and then it went up like that you know and all the little pieces were up there you know and uh, uh, they hooked up the it was a it was a fuel oil machine it had a little gun furnace I think it was, and I don't think it was gas at the time, and uh, and to turn it on it would go mm, it would light up like that you know, and uh, no more ashes, no more hot ashes for the for the sidewalk you know, but uh, no ashes in the house we didn't drag the the you know we used to have that the ash would come you could see it come into the house go to the kitchen go down to the basement, you'd have ash all over. And my mother would be sweeping the ashes up, you know, sometimes, and or with a mop or something, you'd have to clean it up, you'd make an awful mess, you know. And there was a, what I'm telling you is that there was a conversion of that house. That house is actually, it had been converted, you know. It actually was converted. It used to be an octopus, and it was changed to something else. And uh, this is what God wants to do in your life. This is the wisdom of God. That God wants to take the old and put in the new. God wants to take out the old way and put in the new way. If you come into the kingdom of God and you think that you can come into the kingdom of God and not make any changes in your life and you're going to continue to be the same person that you always were, you are fooling yourself and your wisdom and craftiness is not from God. Okay? It's from something else. So, you come into the kingdom of God, all of us, me, you, every one of us who come into the kingdom of God, there must be a change in your life. And we sing a song that says, things are different now. Something's happened to me. This is a song that my that our house is saying. It used to sing this song. Things are different now. Something's happened to me. I'm different. I've changed. Something has come into my life. And I'm a different person. The old has gone out and the new has gone in. What is your testimony? Is your testimony, well, I came into the kingdom of God, but I brought into the kingdom of God all of my sin, all of my past, all the things that I have. You know, God takes me just as I am. I come in and I don't have to change nothing in my life. 
You are not allowing the Holy Spirit to work or operate in your, in your life, in your house. You are allowing Satan, you're allowing the devil and the wisdom of Satan and the craftiness of Satan to rule your life. Even though you claim to be a Christian, you need to have a change in your life. You know, you know I know some people that they change for a while. They come into the kingdom of God and, oh, praise the Lord, everything is good. And then after a little while, they revert and go right back to what they had before. I remember when we took that furnace out, that big octopus, you know. And my, fa I, my father, you know, at first he says, well, maybe we could just move it over and put the thing there. But the thing was so big, we had to take it out. It was so big that we could not go back. It, and sin is so big in your life, you have to get rid of it. You have to take it right out. You can't just set it aside or set it in a, a closet of your heart and say, well, I can go back to that. But you know, that's what a lot of people try to do. That's what they do. They take the sin in their life and they, they get rid of it for a while. We have a story in the Old Testament where one king, he converted to the Lord. You know, he, he, he decided he wanted to go back and he took all of the false gods and all the false statues and all the things that they had and he put them away somewhere. And then when he passed away, his son come, found those things and brought them all back out again. Well, then we have the story, I think it was uh, uh, Josiah, who was uh, a king only when he was eight years old. When he got older, he took all of the things, I think it was him, one of the kings, he took all of the false teaching, all the things, and he burned them to ashes. He burned them to ashes, and he put them on his steps. No, 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 no. He put them, uh, he, he burned them, and he blew them to the wind. He threw them, he got rid of all the things. They couldn't even go get the ashes and, and worship the ashes. He got rid of everything, you know. And that's the way we've got to do with sin in our life. We've got to put it out of our life, so far out of our life, that it can't come back again. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. We have sin in our life, we have things in our life that we do wrong, and we need to confess those things, not to one another so much, or to the priest, but you need to confess those things unto God. Once you confess them unto God, then you got something. When you, when you confess to me, and you say, oh, I have a sin, well, I'm not the uh, lawgiver. I'm not the one who can come and, and forgive your sins. You need to go to the one who can forgive your sins. Ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life. Ask Him to change your life. Ask Him to take the sin out of your life. And this is the wisdom of God. And, and God will change your life. God will turn you around and make you a new person. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Time is going by. And I know that there are people who are watching this program and it's like... Now it's getting close to 5 o'clock. You had your dinner already. And now what are you going to do? You're going to have maybe a little brunch or something? So I don't want to keep you from it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Lord, we thank you for keeping us in your will and in your way. Speak to the hearts of the people who hear this message. Lord, speak to their heart and cause them to realize that you're not a religion, but that you are the way, the truth, and the life and that no man can come to the Father except through you. Speak to our hearts, we pray. Put a heavy conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life, and we ask it in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're dismissed this morning. Praise the Lord. It's bubbling. Oh, it's, it's bubbling. bubbling. It's bubbling. It's bubbling in my soul. I'm singing. Shouting since Jesus made me whole. Folks can't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet. It's bubble, 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 bubbling day and night. Oh, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. I'm singing, I'm shouting since Jesus made me whole. Folks can't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet. It's bubble, bubble, bubble. It's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. I'm
singing, I'm shouting, since Jesus made me whole. Folks can't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet. It's bubbling day and night. Now I will sing. I will shout. I will sing. I will shout. I will sing. And I will shout. Praise the Lord. The gates are open wide, I'll be right at Jesus' side. I will sing, I will shout, praise the Lord. I will sing, I will shout, I will shout, I will sing, I will sing, I will shout, praise the Lord. When the gates are open wide, I'll be right at Jesus' side. I will sing, I will shout, praise the Lord. Praise Oh.